God gifted us with, with music. Um, what, a, what, a powerful, what a powerful gift um, to, to take truth and connect it to the hearts of humans through, through music. And I'm so grateful for the songs and the, and the truth of the songs that were shared this morning. It's just powerful stuff. Um, if you've been tracking with us, or, or if you haven't, um, I'll keep, get you up to speed a little bit. Um, we wrapped up uh, chapter one of James, um, and, and over the past few weeks, we've talked about our need um, as believers to have God's wisdom to, to guide us through and grow us through trials and, and to help us escape and, and stay away from temptations. Temptations are going to be there, but how do we navigate through those? And so we've been talking over the last several weeks about that, and we kind of wrapped up chapter one that dealt with that. And, and then last week, Mike kind of got to it. He, he took us to the end of, the, of chapter one, and he emphasized the need for God's word to get in us and then continually shape us. And, and, and if there's anything I want to constantly encourage all of you to do is read your Bible. Read your Bible. Seriously, just open it up and begin to let God's word get into you. Because when it does, he has a promise that accompanies that, that it's going to make a difference. It's going to begin to shape you. And so uh, Mike was talking about that last week a lot, about just how it, we have to let God's word get into us and continually shape us. And one of the key verses from last week's message is really actually, it's one of the key verses in the entire letter, the entire book of James. And it was James 1.22. And it's a powerful, powerful verse. Remember what it says? It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. I'm just so glad that God inspired James to not finish the sentence at hearers only. He, he puts a comma and he says, deceiving yourselves. And so James is wanting us to understand that there is so much more to Christianity than showing up and sitting in rows on Sunday mornings. He says there's so much more to it than that. And, and the crazy thing is, is, as he's talking, he's writing, he says we can actually deceive ourselves into believing that if I just show up and I sit in a chair and I hear a message that now God and I are good. That's not true. That's not, that's not and, there, and there's this incredible deception that takes place that we kind of go, well, well, if I show up and I sit in a chair and I hear a message, then God and I are good and I get credit with God for showing up. Let me just help, just real quick. I don't believe God has an attendance chart. So you're kind of like, good, I don't have to show up at all anymore. That's not what James is saying. James is saying, if, if all you do is religiously show up, then your religion hasn't compelled you to do anything more than that, then you are, are misled about what Christianity is. If, if that's all that means to you, if, if, if Christianity, the Christian faith, means all I have to do is religiously show up, James says, you're missing the point of what true religion is, what true Christianity is. Let me share with you, again, James is not saying that, that, that showing up isn't good. He, he's, he's not saying that. Showing up is good. Hearing God's word is good. The thing that James will constantly do is he's going to constantly and persistently challenge us to go deeper. He's like, I, I want you to take it in. I want you to show up. I want you to hear. I want you to read. I want you to take it in. But then you need to live it out. You actually have to do something with what you've heard and what you've read. Matter of fact, the living out part is the part that James will challenge us with over and over and over again through this book. He's const Everywhere you turn, he's going to give us something that's consistent with what the Bible says. So we're going to take it in. We're going to hear it. And then he's going to challenge us. Go, okay, now you got to do that. Now you have to do something with it. It's, it's what we do and why we do it that James really presses in on. I'll be honest with you, chatting with Mike and, 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 and others. When we get to the book of James, one of my favorite books in all the Bible, so I love the book of James. I love it and hate it at the same moment, to be quite honest with you. I love it because it's so practical. It's straightforward. It, it's just, it says what it says. You don't have to read a lot of extra into it. It just says, the, the reason it, it's, it's difficult is because you can't read the book of James with an open heart and an open mind and not have it change you. I'm convinced of it. That over the next several weeks as we continue to go through James, if you're letting God speak into your life through this and you actually start putting some of this into practice, you'll be different than the way you started. I'm just convinced that it'll, it'll happen. So to get us started this morning, I just want to share a story with you I, I read several years ago, and, and um, 
the story actually happened. This is a true story of a, of a church and their experience. But I just want to, I thought it was a, a way to kind of get us moving in a direction that James is going to talk to us about this morning. His name was George. He was 22 years old with wild hair, jeans with holes all through them, a psychedelic Grateful Dead t-shirt, and the smell of marijuana hanging on him from last night's party with no shoes. George was brilliant. He was already a year into a psychology graduate program. But as brilliant as George was, he was still seeking answers about life. From his studies and from observation, he knew how amazing the mind was. But his appreciation of this incredible machine caused him to begin to wonder, could there be a designer? And if there is, does he want something more? So George decided to check out a church one Sunday morning. He entered the building dressed in typical fashion for him. Wild hair, jeans with, jeans with holes, Grateful Dead t-shirt, no shoes. The service had already began, so George started down the aisle looking for a seat. Church was completely packed that morning, and he was having a difficult time finding a seat. As he made his way to the front, George became the focus of everyone's gaze, and he was catching some pretty uncomfortable glances from several people. No one said a thing. No one moved to give him room. So when George reached the front, he squatted down and sat on the floor next to the front row of chairs. The church people were really uptight now. There was a tremendous amount of tension in the air. The pastor was a bit distracted, and he tried to con concentrate on his sermon and continue preaching. But then he noticed one of the elderly deacons beginning to make his way from the back toward this young man. Deacon Gray was 80 years old with thinning silver-gray hair that complimented the gray, gray three-piece suit he wore. Although he walked with a cane, he still had an elegance and a dignity about him. As the congregation watched Deacon Gray make his way toward the front, thoughts and whispers began. No one could blame Deacon Gray for doing what he was about to do. The church was completely quiet as Deacon Gray reached George. The pastor stopped preaching as he waited for Deacon Gray to do what needed to be done. With all eyes fixed on him and with a great deal of difficulty, Deacon Gray lowered himself to the floor and he took a seat next to George so George wouldn't have to sit alone. The congregation sat in stunned silence. The pastor, being sensitive to what had just taken place, finally spoke. What I'm about to preach, he said, you will never remember. But what you just have seen, you must never forget. How we treat others and the motivation behind how we treat others concerns God tremendously. And James is going to talk to us about that this morning. This morning's text, let me just share with you how James breaks this out for it. He's going to, he's going to present a case against prejudice or, or favoritism or partiality, this version used. And he does it in kind of a four-step process. First, he introduces a principle. He kind of states this principle. And then he illustrates it. He gives us a picture of what that kind of looks like or maybe what it shouldn't look like in, 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 in word. Then he explains it. And then finally, he applies it. So if you have a Bible, you have a Bible app with you, you go to James 2, chapter 2. We'll have the verses up here, but it's always good to look down, follow along if you want to. And I want you to listen as James makes this opening statement in James chapter 2, verse 1. Here's the principle stated. James says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. James wants us to understand that faith in Jesus and prejudice or favoritism are incompatible with one another. You can't be a genuine believer in Jesus and be prejudiced. He says it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's incompatible. The word partiality in this verse actually comes from two Greek words. So it's a combination word. And when you put these two words together, what it means, it means to accept or receive by face. So, so what James is saying is that there should never be a point in a Christian's life where they make judgments based on externals. You don't make judgments about people at face value. That's, that, those two things don't mix. You can't say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I, I'm prejudiced against, or I favor so this and that. It, that's not compatible. He says that's not how it works. He talks about those, those surface value things that we make judgments on, things like the clothes that people wear, or the cars that they drive, or the color of their skin, or the number of tattoos on that skin, or, I mean, the list goes on and on about how we make these judgments based on externals alone. James says superficial judgments based on outward appearance and faith 
and Jesus don't mix. Kind of simply. I mean, like I said, James is just straightforward. He doesn't, he doesn't mince a lot of words. He says, there should be no favoritism and prejudice in the life of a believer. It should never happen. Here's how James, he's going to flesh out this principle. He's going to give us an illustration that hits home with people sitting in churches reading the letter. See, so understand, when James wrote this letter, it was a circular letter. And so it went to groups of people, and usually it was read out loud in an assembly, just like us. And so they would read this letter that James wrote, and they would pass that letter on to another assembly who would read it. And so these people are sitting, like we are today, in their chairs, in their seats, and they're listening to this letter being read. And so James fleshes out this, this principle. He gives this illustration to these people sitting in their chairs in these churches. And this is what he says. He says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. So, so pause right there. So in a sense, James is painting a picture of this, illustrate, this principle. He's giving us an illustration. He's like, okay, you should never be prejudiced. You should never show favoritism. There shouldn't be partiality. Let me give you a picture of what that might look like. Suppose Mr. Have and Miss Have walk in followed by Mr. Have and Miss Have Not. And they come in and the haves are dripping with jewelry and they're dressed in fine, you know, designer clothing and, the, and they're, they're, they're dressed to the nines. And let's say the Have Nots walk in and they're dressed a lot like George from our earlier lesson. He says, so what do you do? So what do you do when that happens? When, when people walk in and there's people that are dressed you know, to the, to the nines. They're dressed up, they're well-dressed, they're well taken care of, and somebody else walks in, and from appearance sake only, it doesn't look like they care or they have the ability to care about what they look like. What do you do with that? And so here's the response. Here's a response. James says, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, pause real quick. Anything wrong with that? To that point? No, that should happen all the time. Somebody walks in, and we should be just welcoming and gracious and kind. That's, that's how it should always happen. There should be that, that just hospitable attitude towards guests, and that's a good thing. Hey, come and sit here in a good place, right? Oh, which is really weird, right? That means you might have to move out of your good place for somebody else to sit in a good place. Oh, God forbid, we're in a Baptist church. We might not say that. <laughs> But yeah, you might actually not be able to sit on the very back row because somebody else, as a guest, may want to sit on that back row, right? So there's some ideas. So here we go. And that's not picking on back row Baptists. I'm just saying, look around. Um, here we go. So no, no problem. Yeah, all the back row people are like, oh, man, should we move now? Or No, it's too late. You're already there. You are now the point of this lesson. No, I'm just kidding. No, you're not. You're not. I'm just saying it's that idea of when, of not giving up what we like because of the, the way we see somebody else, that we're not willing to, to move and to flex, right? So this says, hey, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and you say sit here in a good place, that's a good thing. That, well, that should happen all the time to, for everybody. But here's, here's where the problem comes in, right? Here's the problem. While you say to the poor man... You stand over there, and the idea was like in a corner almost. You stand over there, or you sit down at my feet. Now, now we have a problem. Not only with what was done, but James begins to dig a little deeper and kind of share with us why, right? Listen to this. He kind of he speaks to motive a little bit. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So James points out two glaring issues. First, what was done, Right? The first thing that was wrong is you made some judgments based solely on external appearance. He's like, what you did was wrong. And then he kind of points out why. The difference in treatment, he says, was due to evil, evil motives. There was something behind why you treated somebody else favorably and treated somebody else unfavorably. He says there's something else in that, whatever that is. And so maybe it's like, well, you know, Maybe, you know, it'll help me along. You know, maybe somehow I'm going to benefit from this. Or, or maybe I just, they're, they're wealthy, and I don't want them to kind of get their feathers ruffled, so I'm going to set them in a section that they're going to be comfortable with, you know, wealthy people. Or, or, or maybe it's, hey, 
I don't know, there's this disconnect with somebody that, that's not wealthy and I, and I don't get it and I feel like, well, maybe they're there and that was their own choosing and that was their own decisions or their bad decisions that led them there. Whatever the reasons are that run through our minds that cause us to make judgments on, God says, there is no reason that holds any water with me. They're all wrong reasons. All of them. And you're like, well, I'm pretty sure he made decisions that landed him there. Yeah, and you're one decision away from landing there yourself. So why? Why, do we, why is there that, that, that tension and that, and that prejudice that exists in God's people? It should never exist in God. Can I give you an example of something that just like, oh, man, it's like Pastor Vent Day. Um, it's like I've actually heard this said. I've heard Christians. Let me take it back. I'm just going to say I've heard Christians say this. Um, if you say this, you're not a Christian. I'm just going to be honest with you. It doesn't mean you're not a believer. It just means you're not Christ-like. I've heard church people. Maybe that's a better word. Because you can show to a church and not be a Christian, right? Just like you can stand in a garage and not be a car, that whole thing, right? <laughs> so I've heard church people make comments like, you know what? We better get them or we better keep them because they're good tithers. I hope I never, ever hear that said here. Ever. We should, you know what I think? I think we should have whoever God determines we should have. No matter the size of their bank account or their social status or their skin color. I don't give a rip. If God's brought them, that's why they're here. They should be here. Doesn't matter. Never say that. We're never to be a church in recruitment phase. We are never to be a church in recruitment phase. We are always to be about sharing the gospel and sharing our lives and letting God set people in the body as he sees fit. That's his job. We don't go out recruiting. This, this isn't church recruitment. How do we get somebody in and we know their social status and this is how it is and that's what's going on? That's not what this is about. This is about allowing God to place in this body who he sees fit. And that's what it's about. Here's, James is going to explain some reasons, right? So he's given us a picture. He's even pointing to the motives behind favoritism and those kinds of things from time to time. Now he's going to give us some reasons behind the principle, right? So think about this. If you're a parent, you've probably said this before to your kid. You told them not to do something. And, 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 and a lot of times we get this weird thing. I, I'm a parent. I've done this before. And it's like, why? Well, why should we? And you kind of get tired. And you're like, because I said so. <laughs> What's amazing about God is he doesn't do that, really. He actually gives reasons. He actually says, I said not to show partiality or favoritism or be prejudiced. He says, I've said that to you, and now I'm going to share with you why. And James kind of lays that out for us. He kind of gives us the reasons behind that principle. And he kind of gives us three reasons why it's wrong. First, he tells us that it's wrong theologically. Like favoritism or to be prejudiced is wrong theologically. He lets us know that prejudice is inconsistent with God's nature and God's methods. Listen to what he says. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, and, 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 and Mike pointed this out last week, and I'm so appreciative of the fact that he did. I'm also appreciative that we record our, the messages. I was away last, last Sunday, and it was, it's so awesome that I get to kind of, it's not the same as being here live, but it's, it, it's great to kind of go back in. I can listen to the message and what was shared. But Mike made a point of how often through this letter, James is teaching some hard stuff. Like, this is hard, right? He's teaching some hard things, but he constantly tells them, you're my beloved brothers. The only reason I'm sharing this with you is because I care about you. And I care about what God's doing in you. And so he says this again. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? And, and, and you can read that, and I don't know about you. At first glance, it almost seems like God is showing favoritism toward poor people. Right? I mean, if you read that and you're like, well, it almost seems like he's talking about not being showing favoritism, but it almost seems like he's showing favoritism towards, towards the poor. Here's the thing that we have to understand. God never plays favorites. He never plays favorites. You, you can't ask God, well, who's your favorite child? He doesn't have a favorite child. He doesn't play favorites. Matter of fact, here's what, here's what Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. He says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. Anybody know what Peter was talking about in that section of Acts when he said that? There was a guy by the name of Cornelius that was a Gentile. 
and he served in the Roman army, and he was of the Italian regiment. And all of a sudden, Peter gets this revelation from God that, hey, people that aren't Jews, that aren't necessarily God followers or God lovers right now, still need the gospel. And Peter says, hey, you know what? Oh, it didn't, it didn't shift, sorry. He says this, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. So I, I understand that God, God doesn't, doesn't have favorites one over the other. There's not somebody that he, he loves more than somebody else. I, I love what um, theologian William Barclay, here's his take on James 2.5, and I thought this was so powerful, so I just wanted to share this with you. This is what he says. He says, James is not shutting the door on the rich. Far from that. He is saying that the gospel of Christ is especially dear to the poor, and that in it there is a welcome for the man who has none to welcome him. And through it, there is a value set on the man whom the world regards as valueless. Man, I thought that was powerful. I remember my grandfather, um, when he was ministering, pastoring, that oftentimes on weekends he would go, and on Saturdays in particular, he would go and he would, he would minister on Skid Row um, in, in L.A. And if you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, it, it's, a, it's a rough area. And, and I can remember him saying, People always were kind of like, well, why? And I remember going with him, which always freaked my mom out a little bit. But I learned a lot of awesome stuff, good stuff, from watching a godly man love on people. Um, but I can remember him saying, you know what? They, they would always give him grief about, like, why would you go there? It's dangerous. He says, you know what? Evangelism and sharing the love of God is a whole lot easier there because those people already know they're broken than it is with a bunch of people that will sit in a church and believe they're above brokenness. I just thought that was always powerful. James is helping us see that from God's perspective, his love and his grace and his salvation are equally available and equally given because he loves everyone and he loves them equally. I, I remember as a kid, right? Red, yeah, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I remember that song. That's true. That's a truth that resonates throughout scripture, and we find it highlighted in no greater way than in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the United States of America. For God so loved white people. For God so loved just the brown people. For God so loved the rich people. For God so loved just the poor. No. For God so loved the world. Here's a, here's a, here's a novel idea. God loves the people of the United States of America as much as he loves the people of the United Arab Emirates. There's a thought. He loves the world. How much? That he gave his only son. That whoever, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Prejudice or favoritism is not consistent theologically at all. It doesn't make any sense. And, and here's the sad thing, and I know as a country, there's, there's, a, there's a horrible cloud continued hanging over our history from years and years ago. As Christian people made distinctions between skin color and who God loved and who he didn't and who was a whole person and who wasn't a whole person, I want you to understand, those were lies perpetuated from the pit of hell. That wasn't Bible. That's not God. That's not true. God loved the world. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Next, James tells us that favoritism is wrong logically. And why, why, why logically? Because it ignores the all-inclusive nature of sin. Listen to what he says. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And James says, besides the fact that it's crazy to exalt the very people that are persecuting you, James is trying to remind them and trying to remind us that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. No one is more or less of a sinner. No one is. There's no one that you go, well, they're more of a sinner than that person. We are all sinners, all of us. Here's the way Paul says it in Romans 3.23. He says, for everyone has sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glorious standard. We are all sinners, and we're all in need of God's grace in our lives. And James tells us we have to remember that when we interact with people, 
all the time. Remember, we are all sinners. So don't overestimate and overvalue somebody or underestimate or undervalue anybody else. He says we're all sinners. We're all on the same playing field. And we've all been given God's, God's grace to come to know him as Savior. Prejudice, favoritism, it's, long, it's wrong just from a logical point of view. Finally, James tells us that prejudice is wrong biblically because it's inconsistent with Scripture. Here's what he says. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, and here he defines what the royal law is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he says you're doing well. But if you show partiality or favoritism, you're committing sin or convicted by the law as transgressors. And so James is trying to help us understand that there is a higher law that should guide and govern the attitudes and the actions of God's people. He says, there's a higher law here in play. There's, there's, a, there's a royal law in play. Throughout the Bible, we're reminded at every turn throughout Scripture of God's unconditional and unlimited love. We, we were walking through that this morning in our growth group, our adult growth group. I think Clark pointed out the fact that from the beginning, God was never a respecter of persons. God would never show favoritism. He gave, he gave salvation to the Jews as much as he did to the Egyptians, as much as he did the other Gentile nations. It was always, he's always wanting relationship. Throughout the Bible, we're reminded of God's unconditional and unlimited love. And for those who have responded in faith to him and to his love, he calls us higher. He's like, hey, I loved you. You responded to that. Now I'm calling you higher in your life. But here's the problem. As Christians, as, as those God has called to be reflections of and conduits of his love, we can be guilty of placing limits and conditions on God's love. God doesn't have any limits. God doesn't have any conditions on his love. But as Christians, we can become guilty of doing that, right? Well, I'll love you if. I'll, I'll love you with the love of God if you don't speak with an accent. Or I'll love you with the love of God if your skin color looks a lot like my skin color. Or I'll love you with the love of God if you're educated. Or I'll love you with the love of God if your children behave. Or I'll love you, whatever it is. Here's the crazy thing. We come up with a lot of excuses for our behavior, and then we try to spin it in a way that doesn't make it seem so bad. And we'll start using these real Bible words like discernment to indicate why we lack love. And James is like, stop it. Quit. Quit believing, well, we can't love on that person because we're being discerning. No, you're being prejudiced. That's what you're being. doesn't mean every time that you love on somebody, it looks the same, but love is love. And it has to be put into practice, and there has to be action that accompanies it. God knows us, and he knows how we operate. And because of that, he gives James these next words. Look what he says. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, has become accountable or guilty of it all. And we use this word, we use this, we kind of, we, this verse, we kind of pluck that out of context a lot, and we talk about, hey, we're all sinners, because you, if you violated one law, you violated them all. Understand, James is writing to believers. He's writing to Christians, and says, hey, whoever keeps the whole law, you're following along God's <laughs> commands, and you fail in one point, you're accountable for or guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So what James is trying to help us understand is that scriptures are not a smorgasbord. You don't get to pick and choose which ones you're going to follow or which ones you're going to apply or which principles you're going to enact in your life. You don't get to pick and choose that. We don't get to say, well, that's more important than that one is. It's like saying this. Here, here's, the, here's the thought. It's like saying, I know I was doing 95 and a 25, but I didn't kill anyone. That's great, but you're still a transgressor of the law. You still broke the law. Now, the consequences may vary. The, 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 the severity of the punishment for the violation may vary, but the reality that you broke the law remains the same. You were still doing 95 and a 25. And, and somehow, in our Christian thinking, we spin this to go, well... I can do all these other things well. James says, you can do all these other things well, but if you don't show love unconditionally, you're violating God's law, and not just any law, the royal law, the king's law, the law of the kingdom. He says, you're not just violating any law, you're violating the king's law, the kingdom's law. 
as we wrap up this morning, James kind of wraps up his thoughts on prejudice and he gives us basically three principles for us to apply, right? So it's like, okay, the principle is don't, be, don't show favoritism and prejudice towards anyone. Don't over-elevate or underestimate anyone. He says, that's the principle. I gave you a picture of what that is. I shared with you why. And he says, now here's the application. Let me help you hone in on what we do with this, right? So here it is. First, let the Bible, not your bias, be your standard. Here's what James says. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. So instead of excusing our prejudices with things like, well, that's just the way I was brought up. Or, well, that's just the way I am. James says, tell you what, why don't you let God's word start to dictate how you think and speak and act? Why don't you let that start to shape you instead of constantly falling back into these ruts? Well, you know, in the area where I was brought up or the family I was brought up, that was just normal to, to talk about people or to, or to think about people this way. James says that's no excuse. You have a new nature in you if you're a believer and a child of God. Let that get in you and let God shape your, the way you think and you speak and you act. By the way, there's a warning here, right? Do you see it? It's a not-so-subtle reminder that we as Christians, we can sit back and pass judgment on others, but we will ultimately be judged. And the standard is God's word, the perfect law of liberty. At some point, I mean, we can sit back and make all these judgments and call it discernment if you want to. We can make these judgments about people and whether we'll love them or not. But James says, remember, when, it, when your time is up, when your life comes to an end, you're going to be judged as well. And the standard is God's word, not what you believe, not what you think, not how you were raised, not environment you were subjected to. What did God's word say? Here's another one. Let love be your law. Let love be your law. Tucked into our text this morning, if you, if you really look closely at it, is the reality that some of the neediest people in our society are also the ones who are often on the receiving end of prejudice response. Let me say that again, just so you understand. Some of the neediest people, some of the most marginalized, some of the most overlooked people in our society are also the people that are often on the receiving end of prejudice responses. And that can be because of ethnicity, that can be because of age, that can be because of of social status or wealth or whatever it is. Some of the neediest people are the ones that are, that are prejudiced against. The, the most prejudice is, is lobbed against them the most. Before you act or speak, maybe here's what we should do. Before we, before we even say anything, because that's where it starts. That's where we tend to get ourselves in trouble first, right? We think it, which is not good, and then we say it, and then somehow, after it gets out there, we're like, oh, man, I probably shouldn't say this. So, so before you speak or before we act, maybe we should think this. What can I do to love that person? What can I do to build that person up? Before you say a word or do anything, maybe, maybe place your thoughts through that filter. Place your actions through that filter. What can I do to love that person? How can I build them up? Here's another application for us. Let mercy be your message. Let mercy be your message. Here's what James says. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no, no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Again, this is a not so subtle reminder about the way we will be judged by God if we fail to show mercy to people, right? That's what he said. If you don't show mercy then you will be judged with no mercy. That's what God says. And then he says this. He makes this powerful statement about the power of mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Always. If love leads, then mercy wins. Always. Always. Let me just share with you a thought that I don't know, I just had as I was preparing this and studying through this, and I want to read it because I don't want to make a mess of it. But just kind of an observation. In a world 
that seems to vacillate between political correctness, where personal biases and prejudices are masked beneath carefully constructed personas and well-chosen words, and on the other extreme, toxic hate speech, where opinions are spouted without care or concern for those who are targeted and those who are injured by mindless spillage, here's the reality. God calls you and me higher than that. He calls us higher than that. I know we're like, well, we've got to make sure we say it just right. James says, don't even think it, so you don't have to figure out how to say it just right. He says that, that political correctness is a joke, because if it's already hidden in there and it's in your mind and you're trying to figure out how to craft the words so it doesn't offend somebody, the problem isn't so much with your words, it's what's going on in your heart. He's like, fix that. And then on the other side, we have people who don't give a rip about the people they injure or target, and they just say stuff, stupid stuff, and then hold up a Bible and can profess to be a Christian. God, through the pen of James, said, no, you're not. Try again. He called, God calls us higher than that. He, he beckons us and begs us higher than that. We're going to take a few minutes in just a second here to, to just pause and reflect on what God is speaking to each of us individually. Can I, can I encourage you with something real quick before we do that? If we want to see a country turning their hearts back to God and understanding what God's love is all about and what it looks like, it starts with you and me, right? I'm a big, I mean, I think we should pray for our leaders. We always should. We should pray for our nation. We should always do that. But let me help you understand something. Change comes at home first. It starts with me. It starts with you. Don't expect God to step in and make a revolutionary change in this entire country when his people won't turn their hearts back to him and allow him to start changing us to begin with. Okay? So don't pray for God to change your country if you're not willing to let God change you. It's a stupid prayer. Don't pray it. I think it's one of those where God goes, really? Seriously? I've been trying to work on you for a month, and you're just like, well, pray for so-and-so. Pray for me. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for whatever. Pray for your leaders, for sure, but maybe when you're looking for God to do something and begin change, ask him to change us first. We're going to pause and just reflect on what maybe God's speaking to us individually. I want to encourage you with just two, two simple thoughts today before we just press pause. Here's the first one. God loves unconditionally. Unconditionally. What does that mean? That means that he doesn't love you any more or any less because of what you have or what you've done or what you don't have or what you, do, you, you haven't done. You know why God loves you? Because of who he is. Not because of what you've done or failed to do or what you have or don't have. That's not how God's love works. God loves unconditionally. Here's the second part I want you to just consider. He's called us to do the same. He's called us to do the same. We can't name the name of Christ and believe in our hearts or at least believe in our minds that God loves unconditionally and then give ourselves opportunity and allow ourselves to love any differently than that. We, it doesn't mix. It doesn't mesh. And it doesn't connect with people that are looking for a God that will love them unconditionally when Christians don't. Let me just ask you, as you, as we pause for just a moment, let you just sit quietly, just pray for a moment. First of all, understand something. If you're, if you're in this place where you're like, man, I, I'd love to step into a relationship with God, but I've just done so much stuff. I just have so much stuff hanging in my life. There's just so many things that have just dirtied up my life. Can I help you understand something? Right now, right where you're at, right in the middle of the mess maybe, God loves you unconditionally. He does. You trying to clean yourself up will not make him love you anymore. But what he wants is a relationship with you. And you can't do that. He does. So all he needs is for you to say yes to his love and his grace in your life and what Jesus did to make that relationship happen, which is pay for your sins. So you don't have to sit in this pit of guilt feeling like somehow I have to keep paying for or making amends for my sins. Let me help you understand something. God in his unconditional love already took care of that for you. 
his son went to a cross for you for that. It's done. It's taken care of. The sin that you regret from the past, the sin you're mixed up in right now, and the sin you're probably going to commit in a couple hours here, or a couple minutes, who knows? I know me. It'll be a couple seconds. He's paid for that. He's paid for that. doesn't give me a license to do whatever I want. It makes me grateful for a God that loves me like that. Amen. So if that's where you're at, don't let that keep you from receiving that love that God gives and grants to you unconditionally in the relationship he's offered to you through the death of his son. Please don't let that keep you back. Secondly, understand if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that unconditional love that you were saved with, God wants you to spill that on people without, with reckless abandon, without any hesitation, without any pause. You don't have to stop and think, well, I wonder if I should love that person today. The answer is absolutely unequivocally yes. Love them. Love them. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. He loves them, and he wants us to love them. And maybe that's your sticking point, because you know a lot of stuff that you're against, and you know a lot of people that are wrapped up in the stuff that you're against. And that's okay to have opinion and, 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 and be biblical in what we believe. What's not okay is to fail to love people. That's never okay. That's not okay. And you got to figure that out. And God in his grace and his wisdom will help you. I believe it. So let's just pause for a moment. Father, we're just, um, man, we, um, it's so easy for me to wrestle with you on this stuff. It's so for, easy for me to say, yeah, but, yeah, I hear what you said, but, God, you have to understand my reasons and my perspectives and my point of view. And God, please help us to just be people shaped by your word. Help us to understand that you're on a rescue mission for humanity and you've invited us to be ambassadors on that mission. God, help us to know that as we step into our world, as we step into our families and work life and school life and, and all the things that we're in, that we go forward as representatives of a God that loves unconditionally. God, my heart just breaks this morning. The people who have not come to know your love because of my conditioned love. Forgive me for that. Correct me and shape me to be a better reflection of a God that has arms wide open and love with no limits. God, help us understand that your love while it loves all sinners, we understand, we get it, that it's still sin. We understand that that needs to be paid for and that needs to be corrected. We get that, but it doesn't mean that we fail to love fellow sinners because we are, we are all sinners. God, I pray this morning, if there's somebody here that hasn't accepted your son and really 
embraced what that unconditional love is, that today would be that day. That they wouldn't necessarily look at Christians that messed this up, but they would look at the Christ who didn't, who loves them flawlessly. God, help us as followers of Jesus to do just that and not get hung up on trying to mimic another follower, but to be true followers of Christ. Keep our eyes on him. How did he speak? How did he respond? How did he love? And help that become true of us. God, I thank you so much for your mercy and your grace and your love with no limitations. Help us be people that love like that. And we just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning.